Mama's Day today. Can you believe it? it? It actually comes around once a year by the world's calendar. But by ours, I hope it's every day. Amen? And I am really digging the bonnets this morning. If you can't see over the head of the person in front of you and they're wearing one, if you pull it down real hard, don't take it off. Just pull it down real hard. It will work. But uh, I'm digging that today. Now, I will say this. I've already this morning had three. I'm not even sure how to take this. I'm trying to sort this out. But three people have now wished me a happy Mother's Day. So I don't know what is it the necklace? Is it what is it? I don't know what it is. I don't have an earring, so um, I cannot be confused with a woman like so many others. But uh, no, no, I'm just take, I'm, I'm just kidding. But um, I don't know uh, where that came from. But I, they thank you for wishing me a happy Mother's Day. I've never been there, never done that, and um, but thank you that you believe I could. <laughs> I want to, first of all, uh, I want to say, I want to begin by blessing my wife. Honey, I wish you a happy Mother's Day. You know, I, I am first-hand experience. I have not ever seen, uh, been able to watch a mother mother uh, from as close as I've been able to watch you. And, and I can tell you, watching you uh, nurture and do for our children what you have done well, we've been married for 30 years, but you have done this for almost 29 years. And I've watched you be a mother, show how to be a mother, learn how to be a better mother, and do it all with grace and dignity and honor, and I bless and honor you today. Happy Mother's Day. And happy Mama's Day to every one of you that are in this room or you are watching online, wherever you might be. And, and I want to say this, I was speaking with my mom yesterday, she lives in Spring, Texas, and, and I was speaking with her yesterday, she said, now you be sure and you tell all those mamas at the rock that tomorrow that I said happy mother's day and then and then when I so happy mother's day for my mom in spring texas and my wife said to me when I got off the phone with my mother I told her I loved her and wished her happy mother's day when I got off the phone with her she said you better not forget <laughs> because she will blow up facebook and let everybody know he didn't say what I said but I am I am so uh, blessed and thankful today for uh, who every mother is uh, no matter what the background is, we'll talk about that in a moment. But I want to jump into what I want to speak today, and that is Ruth's redemption. Such an amazing story in Scripture is the story of Naomi and Ruth. It is, um, you really, there's way more to that story than I'm ever going to be able to get into in the next few minutes. Um, but I'm going to try to hit some high points of the story of Naomi and Ruth that really are in every way depict what it is to be a mother and what it means to become a mother. Um, and there is such a story of redemption that is found in that relationship between the two of them that I could not think of a better story to use to illustrate uh, the power and the anointing and the potential that is in the life of every woman who bears a child and, and those who have not, but in time will. There's an author, I don't know who it is, it's an unknown author, but I read this some time ago and, and I want it, there's two things that I read and I'm going to begin with this one, but I read this some time ago, I wrote it down just for this day and uh, again the author is unknown, but I thought man what an amazing statement and it is this, it says motherhood is a million little moments that God weaves together with grace redemption, laughter, tears, and most of all, love. Isn't that amazing, Michelle? Motherhood is a million little moments that God weaves together with grace, redemption, laughter, tears, and most of all, love. Now, I realize as I stand here this morning, I realize that all of us have a very different reference point with moms. All of us. All of us in this room, every single one of us, none are raised alike because no two of us are alike. Even uh, the mother in a single household with multiple children, each of them are raised somewhat differently because each of them requires something different. Every mother with multiple children will know. This one, I, I can tell you as a father, my three children, there were some that required more instruction <laughs> than others. Some required a little bit less than others. So all of us have a very different reference point with mothers. Some of us 
have only known one mother in our entire life. Some of us have mothers that have been represented in different ways, many different ways. And whatever that reference point, whatever our experiences are, they have shaped us very, very differently. And I can tell you that regardless of the reference point that we have, we have all learned, every one of us have learned how to grow from whatever that experience is. No matter who you are today, if you are breathing on this earth, you came from a woman. You were born of a woman. There is a mother somewhere, whether you know her or you do not, whether you care for her today or whether you do not, whether she means something of significance to you today or does not, I can t there is no question, all of us came from the womb of a mama. Some among us in this room right now, you are mothers right now, and then there are others of you that are waiting for your moment. Your moment has not yet come. You are, you are in every way exercising faith. You are believing, as Sarah did, you are believing, or Sarah, you are believing for what has not yet come, but it will. Motherhood looks very differently in very different situations. I know uh, from experience, I'm going to share in just a moment, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I can tell you from my own experience, I experienced a, I grew up in the home of a mom, I know what it is to have a mother. I know what that relationship was like. I know what it is to grow up in the home of a stepmother. I know what that relationship is like. And I know what it is to grow and to learn and to be challenged and to be changed in the home of a mother-in-law. And I can tell you that these things reflect very differently in how we are geared and how we grow and how we learn and how we change. Today, I am going to very briefly share with you, as I said a moment ago, the story of Naomi and Ruth. How many are familiar with that story? Just hold your hand up. You're familiar with the story of Naomi and Ruth. It's a phenomenal story. It is one of the most amazing stories of grace and redemption and love and family and connection. Um, it, I don't know if there's a better story. There are other stories equal to it, but not in relationship to mamas. This says it better, I believe, than any other. And it says it in two ways, and I want to address both of those today, and that is one, Naomi knew how to be a mother. Ruth learned how to become a mother. So I want to speak to all of those things, both of those things today in the lives of our mamas. And I want to give thanks to every single mama sitting in this room for being faithful over the one or the ones that the Father has charged you with. You have a child because he believed you could do it. I know in the minds of some, they're like, no, no, you have no idea he, if he really knew me. I knew the day I found out I was pregnant, God didn't know me. Because if he really knew me, he knew this is the wrong time. But I've said this before, and I'll say it again, and I say it out of my own experience. I won't dive into today, but I'll say, it, say this again. And that is, no matter how you came into this earth, no matter how you arrived, no matter how you became seed in the womb of your mama, you became seed. You did not become that without the approval of God. You did not become a human being conceived in the womb of a woman, no matter how you got there. Now, I think I need to reiterate that a minute. No matter how you got there, you got there with God's approval. Now, we might say, well, I don't know, because let me not paint pictures. You don't know the story. And the way the story unfolded did not honor God. Well, maybe the way it unfolded, it did not. The question isn't, did the story unfold correctly? The question is, was the seed in the womb intentional? I think some of you understand what I just said. The question isn't whether this came 
in a way that honored the Father. It is all about the fact that if a seed forms in the womb of a woman, it formed with the approval of God. The path to get there might have to be repented of. But mama, don't ever repent of the seed in the womb. Among us, maybe in this room or watching online, there might be some that made a decision in times past to not carry the seed. I want to tell you today, I don't want you to carry that. Do not carry in your bosom a decision you made without knowledge. But instead, carry in you the knowing that you repented, God forgave, and now ask, what comes next? Do you hear me in this house today? So no matter how the seed came, whether it be me, my story, or whether it be you and yours, no matter how the seed came, I'm telling you, if a heartbeat started, it was with God's approval. So I need you to say this with me this morning. Can you say this with me? Put your hands on yourself and say, I am here. I am here. Oh man, you better say it now. You better, you better say it like you mean it this morning. Say, I am here, I am here. with God's approval. approval. O-M-G. <laughs> you might say, man. But what about my mama? She's a, I don't even know my mama. Or my mama did this. Or my mama's there. Or my mama doesn't even love God. And my mama doesn't even... Sometimes, oftentimes, it's not about the path. It's about the intended seed. <laughs> you got to hear what I'm saying to you this morning. Let's talk about Naomi and Ruth this morning. So again, I, I was telling you I was reading something recently, and in reading that, I, uh, there was a couple of things that I had written down, and, and this is the second thing. It says, you can't build a reputation when you don't have the right character, and you can't have the right character if you don't have the right attitude, habits, and most importantly, faith in Yahweh. You know, I like to read. I'm a reader. I enjoy reading, and I enjoy diving into things that I do read. But this jumped out at me like the other did that was from the unknown author, and this is as well. But again, it says you can't build a reputation when you don't have the right character, and you can't have the right character if you don't have the right attitude, habits, and most importantly, faith in Yahweh. So let's just jump into, uh, again, I'm going to do this very briefly today. I don't intend to hold you very long. I want you to be able to go celebrate and get to the restaurants before everybody else does. Um, <laughs> But uh, I want to share this story very briefly with you, and I want to tell you some background with the story of Ruth and Naomi in case you are not familiar with it. Naomi was a woman married to a man named Elimelech. Uh, they had two sons. Um, we could get into the names. I'm just going to say two sons and go from there. One of those sons was married to a Moabite woman named Ruth. Everybody say he was married to Ruth. <laughs> so Naomi was Ruth's mother-in-law. I want you to follow along, make sure we're all clear. Everybody say Naomi was Ruth's mother-in-law. So one was married to Ruth, and then in time, Naomi's husband, both all, her husband and both of her sons died. And then when they died, they obviously left two widowed daughters-in-law. Really cool thing happens when we dive into that story. We're about to do that in Ruth chapter 1. Naomi encouraged both of these women both Ruth and the other daughter-in-law, she encouraged them to return to their husband's families. Go back to them. This is the way. You need to go back to them. Both of these girls looked at Ruth. We're going to read it in just a second, but I want you to get the general idea. Looked at Naomi, and they said to Naomi, we will not go. Wherever you go, we'll go. And then she says something to them that I think is profound, and she begins to explain to them what that means. Because every good mother is going to help a child understand what lies in the path ahead. 
Every good mother is preparing them for what lies ahead. And she begins to share with them. And again, we're going to read it in a moment, but I want to generalize it. And she says to them, she says, if you go with me, there's no chance I'm going to have a child again. I'm too old. So if I don't have a son, you can't marry a son. And even if I do have a son, by the time I have a son and he's old enough to be married, you're too old. So you're really wasting your time, and I'm paraphrasing, but you're really wasting your time going with me. So one of the girls said, okay, I'm out. <laughs> I'm done. You said, all I need to know, I love you, but thank you. I'm going back to my widow, my husband, ex-husband, I'm go- whatever you want to call him. I'm going back to my deceased husband's family, and I'm going to carry on the family name with someone out of his lineage. And then the other, Ruth says, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to go where you go. I'm going to live where you live. I'm going to eat what you eat. I'm going to die where you die. I'm going to be buried, in fact, where you're buried. You cannot separate yourself from me, nor I from you. This is Ruth's story of reputation, her reputation, her redemption, her character and faith. And we're going to begin with Ruth chapter 1, verse 6. And it picks up right after Naomi's husband and sons had died. It says, Then she arose, Naomi arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughters, to her two daughters-in-law, Go return, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you, or grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices, and they both wept. And they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and said, Adios, but Ruth clung to her. (laughs) She probably didn't speak Spanish. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said to her, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God mine. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. There's a profound, there's so many profound things in this, I can only dive into a couple. Another time, maybe we'll dive into this story and just do a series on it because it is incredible. I want to talk about the reputation and the character of this woman called Naomi who knew how to be a mother. Everybody say, Naomi Naomi. knew knew. how to be a mother. I'm blessed in that when I was uh, growing up, I had both my mother and my stepmother, two incredibly different people. They are totally different. They both raised me in the time that I was with each of them. They would uh, raise me very differently. My mother is watching this morning, and I love her. my mother and uh, my biological mother in Houston, uh, outside of Houston in Spring, Texas. And mom, happy Mother's Day. I told you that yesterday, but I mean it again today, and I mean it every day. Um, if I ever forget to say it, just know in your heart that I did not forget to say it in my heart. Might have, maybe with my, my, my voice, but uh, did you get your card? I just want to make sure. <laughs> but there's something really profound about all of this, and that is that, you know, growing up in the home of my mom, in the home of a stepmother, um, I saw a lot of things that many of you would have seen as well. Not, no reason to go into what I did see or didn't see, what was good, what was bad, uh, what I wish had been different. There are many of those things probably in all of our lives. But I had, they were my, both of those were my reference point for what a mother is. And growing up in that environment, watching and seeing and witnessing, I can tell you that 
even when my mom was chasing me around, I've told you this story before, she would chase me around the glass table in the living room in the trailer that we lived in. She would chase us around that and she was going to spank me, but she never did catch me. But she would chase me around that glass table, big round glass table, it was huge. And she would chase me around that thing and try to spank me and I just kept running until she tired out and had to sit down. But, uh, but I, I knew love for my mom. I knew love from her. I knew when I came home from school, and I've said this before, and she'd be hiding in a closet, and she would whistle, and she would play little games. And, and I'd come home from school, and she had a special day at work, and, and she brought me my first calculator, the Texas Instruments calculator that I still have today. I was probably 10 or 11 years old. I still have that solar calculator in my desk drawer today. And, um, and I still have the Bible my father gave me. This isn't Father's Day, so I'm going to talk about Mom. But she <laughs> brought me the... Um, she brought me that little calculator and just little things that I knew that I knew I was loved. There were times certainly that um, were challenging, but in the middle of it all, I knew I was loved. And I learned things from my mom. I learned uh, how um, to walk through some difficult times. I watched her suffer. I watched her go through uh, moments that were challenging. And, and as I stood on the on the back side and the other side of the living room when I could see her being beaten and I would watch this and I could see this and witness this and and I remember a particular time um, my brother and I tried to intervene in the middle of her being beaten um, by her then husband and when that was going on and I know mom you're watching I'm not trying to uncover but I'm just trying to tell you you're a mom in whom I'm glad I'm your son and um and my brother and I tried to intervene, and, and uh, that did not, we were kids, you know, I was little, and I was 10 or 11, and my brother was a couple years older, but, um, but I even, I got to watch my mother in those moments, in those times when it was very difficult for her, um, with a man who drank all the time and beat her, seemed like all the time, and didn't like any of her kids, he liked his own, but he didn't like us, and watching that and seeing how my mother responded and reacted to those moments watching her be as strong as she knew to be her being a woman who came from a very very discombobulated home as well and seeing these things and knowing what I know there's stories that my mother holds in her heart today that she's never shared with us and I don't know and some of it I don't want to know but what I do know is I watched her and I learned from her and I learned how to be strong I learned how to persevere I did learn that. I did learn that, you know what, even when you're being whipped and you're being beaten, for lack of a better way to put it, because that's the reference point. Looking across that living room and seeing her sitting on that rocking chair with a man hunkered over her just beating her. And watching that and trying to intervene as a child and there was nothing we could do about it. But I know this, as we would watch and witness that, I could see my mom rise up from that sofa every time and look at us kids and say, are you hungry? How many pancakes do you want for breakfast today, son? Do you want fried chicken for dinner? Do you want pork chops? It was never getting off of that rocking chair and saying, um, get out, go away. I, I, I don't have time for you and these issues. She would get up off of that rocking chair in the middle of what she had just gone through. Her mind obviously on trying to make sure she's okay. But before she would even do that, to look at her two sons and at the time daughter, look at them, look at us, and say to us, what do you need? That's a mom. That's a mom. Mom, I love you for it. Stop there for pause for a second. But I love you for it. And then, um, then I married my wife. You know, I grew up, became a man, mostly. And um, I'm still working on being a better man every day. But I grew up and then uh, I saw things. I didn't want to marry. I didn't want to be a, a married man. I didn't, what I saw in marriage didn't look good. I had a wonderful father who taught me how to be a good man and taught me how to be a good husband. But I also saw the bad things that could happen. And when I weighed it out in a balance... I thought, I don't want to marry until one day Yahweh introduced me to this incredible woman on the front row. When he introduced me to her and I met her, everything in me changed. I was 26 years old, 27 maybe. When suddenly, up till that time, I was just, there was no way, and I meet her. 
And when I met her and Holy Spirit said, that's going to be your wife, immediately he changed my heart and he said, Steve, no matter, he didn't say this verbally, but I know this is what he was establishing in me. No matter what you've seen and no matter what your reference point is, I want to tell you in me, there is another way. I want you to cling to the good that you learned and you saw. And I want you to look past what you saw that wasn't. Forgive and work past it. Walk past it. So I'm, my wife and I get married and I meet my soon-to-be mother-in-law. And what I didn't know at the time when my wife and I married was the, the first night, my wife was trying to escape me. And in that escape process, it just didn't work because I, was, I just kept showing up everywhere. And um, I was like Facebook. And, uh, but my mother-in-law, when she met me the first time, she said to Kim, she said, he's the one. He's the one for you. She came into the church. I don't know if I was preaching that night or not when she came in. Was I preaching when she came that night? I wasn't. I just met her at the door, I think. You, oh, I was a greeter at the door, probably only because I was looking for her. But um, <laughs> like some of you have done in this church, I, don't, don't even, don't, don't play with me. And... Um, <laughs> you, you love everybody, but you're looking for somebody. I get it. I, listen. The, um, so I met my, my soon-to-be mother-in-law, and when I met Linda Reichert, whom some of, many of you know, and when I met Linda Reichert, I began to see something of a different kind and began to witness what I believe really demonstrates and illustrates in my timeline who Naomi was to Ruth and her timeline. And one of the things that I thought was awesome that I learned from Linda Reichert, and I, I could go on and on with, with her and who, the kind of woman that she was, but one of the things that I learned from her that was profound and changed my entire perspective was she said to me many times, but I remember the first time, we'll never forget it, and she said, you will never, this was at our wedding, this was after we were married, she said, you will never be my son-in-law. I just want you to know today, you will never be my son-in-law. You will always be my son. There will never be an addendum to who you are in this family. You are a son to me as Jimmy is a son to me. And when she said that that day, I just was like, oh my gosh, you know, just trying to wrap my mind around what it meant for a woman who didn't really know me that well yet, but she saw something there. And it started something in me, and I learned over the years she passed away. Actually, tomorrow will be 13 years ago. Tomorrow she passed away. And, but in the time that we were able to walk together and be together, my wife and me and her and our kids, and is it tomorrow? Yeah, she, yeah I got that backwards. I'm, I want to do that right. So Friday was 13 years ago. But in that time that I was able to walk with Linda Reichert, I never one time experienced that she did not mean what she said. There were times that she would say things to me and I would feel so unworthy of even that conversation. This conversation isn't something... I'm, I'm, it, it, it just suffice it to say, it took me a long time to get past the idea, I'm your son-in-law. All I am is your son-in-law. It took me a long time to get past that while in my mind, all I was was her son-in-law. In her mind, I was her son. And that there was no chance anything else would be acceptable. And when Kim and I were in Panama City, where they were, and we said to them and to the others, we're leaving, we're leaving here, we're being sent to Central Florida to go and to establish the Rock of Central Florida. And when we were going out, her, uh, she with Larry came into our, came into our home, I, we had dinner one night, and, and in the same way, it was a little reversed, but in the same way Ruth said to Naomi, Linda said to Kim and me, she said, wherever you go, we will go. You are our son, and you are our daughter. She made sure and never let it be a mystery 
about that. She always made sure I, she w- that I was clear the best she could. You are not my son-in-law. If I ever said something, gave her a card, Happy Mother's Day from a son, your son-in-law, immediate correction came in. I'm saying all that for a reason. She loved me like her own. Now I want to point out something that we just read in this scripture. I want to show you something. There is something incredible about someone who is a mother. Remember, Naomi is a mother. Ruth is becoming a mother. She's going to become a mother. Both of those are represented in this room. Some are mothers. Some will become mothers one way or another. If that's that's the desire of your heart, you will become a mother, however that might be, whether it's the seed in your womb, through adoption, I don't know how, but somehow if that's in your heart, listen to me. I want to tell you this, first of all, don't count out any way that the Father provides. Never overlook his provision and never feel less about how he provides one way over another. But I love here, when you read in Ruth chapter 1, the writer addresses Naomi's son's wives as daughters-in-law. Naomi addresses her son's wives as daughters all throughout Ruth. She always addresses them as daughters, never as daughter-in-law, except for one occasion, and that is here. She says, in verse 12, let me start with verse 12 and just read a few more. She says, turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they, the daughters, lifted up their voices and they wept again. And Oprah kissed her mother-in-law. See how she saw Naomi? She kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Naomi said, the only time she used sister-in-law, Ruth, see your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For wherever you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, my God yours. Where you die, I die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do to me and more also, if anything but death separates or parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. But in every instance, Naomi refers to these two girls as daughters until one of them says, one of them divorces her. Whether, even if it was by the Spirit, because she was married to the Son, she separated herself from Naomi, and when she did that, suddenly she now has become a daughter-in-law. See, The idea of being a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law, and I'm saying all of this for a reason today. I'm getting somewhere. The idea of being a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law is with exactly that. It is by law. It is what a certificate has provided. But when we can transcend that, like a mama does, like Linda Reichert did for me, and like so many of you mothers have done, anytime a mother does not receive the in-law that comes into the home, She's living, trying to formulate and fashion a relationship by law that will only produce death because law produces death. Law never produces life. If you want the right relationship with those who are your sons-in-laws or your daughter-in-laws, the only way to receive them is not as an in-law, but as a son or a daughter. Naomi knew how to be a mother because she was a mother. Motherhood did not mean to her what came out of my womb. Motherhood meant to her who has come to me. Which of you has been sent to me? And however you came to me, you are not that by law. I receive you by spirit. That is the power of a mama. And Naomi's reputation and character was so present. And I want you to write this. If you're writing, you can write it. If not, just try to remember it. But there is no reputation without right character. There cannot be a right reputation without right character. Let me point out some things about Naomi that made her so incredible and powerful, just like so many of you. Naomi was gentle. She was kind. She was loving. She was honest. She was compassionate. 
Naomi had clearly represented herself as someone who could be trusted and easily loved. She made herself easily loved, no doubt. For these two girls to want to be with her and be around her, she made herself easy to love. She did not make it difficult. She didn't look at these girls and ever draw from that, that relationship that you have tried to, you're separating my son from me. Instead, she said, you are being added to me. I am blessed because you are being added to me. You are not coming to me by law. You married him righteously, and by righteousness, you are now mine. It's powerful. Even in the loss of their husbands, the daughters-in-law did not want to leave Naomi because they were no longer in law. Naomi did not see them that way. To her, they were her daughters. Her character set her apart, and she was desirable to be found with and difficult to be a part from She imparted her character to Ruth. One received and stayed. One received, became a daughter, and never left. One received as long as she was in the house, but then left because of law. I belong with my husband's family. Law brought her in, and law took her out. With Ruth, law brought her in, but righteousness, character, attitude, faith kept her in. Let's talk about that. Attitude, habits, and faith, Ruth learned how to become a mother. Without the right attitude, habits, and faith in God, wrong character develops. In Ruth chapter 4, let me read this, says this, beginning with verse 13. Well, let me give you a little in between chapter 1 and chapter 4. Let me do this and try to get all my points correct here. So bottom line, Ruth goes with Naomi. They leave Moab. They go back to Judah, to Bethlehem. They go back, and in their going back, they are possessing the land that was owned by her Deceased husband, Elimelech. This is Naomi's husband. They're living on that land, but they don't have money. They have no income. They have no way to survive, to live. They have this land, but that's all they've got. They still have to eat. So in order to do that, she sends Ruth out. She says, Ruth, we've got to eat. And Ruth goes out, and she goes into a field owned by a man that was family or relationship to Elimelech, who was Naomi's husband. So she goes into that field, and she's out there, and she's gleaning, which was right to do. The poor were allowed to go and glean. When the reapers were in the fields harvesting the wheat, they would bundle it all up, and every now and then there would be pieces that would fall off. In Scripture, they would set that aside to the edge of the field specifically for the poor. So then she could come out, and every day Ruth would go find her way along the sides of that field, and she would gather up what was left behind, what had not been picked up, that was left for the poor, She would take it home and she would eat. She did this every single day. She was noticed how she did this with a good heart. She did this with a good spirit. She went in there every day. She was faithful. She was providing. She was taking care of Naomi. She was taking care of herself. She was noticed. I'm I'm putting a lot of pieces together right here. It comes to Boaz's attention. Someone informs him. There's a woman out here in the field that shows up every single day. She's picking up. What's left every single day? It's the same woman every day. She comes in here. She causes no trouble. She says nothing to no one. She comes in. She gets what's left over, and she goes back to Naomi. Boaz says, let me watch. He watches her do what she does, recognizes there's something special about her. He says to his men, he said, I want you to protect her. I don't want her going to another field. He said, I want to make sure that she is safe. I don't want any of you men to touch her, as would the custom be. If she's out there, whoever wants her can have her, but not you men. Do not touch her. You leave her alone. And you let her get enough food to feed her family. In fact, I want to make sure she gets more than enough. I want her belly to be full. And I want Naomi's belly to be full, or whoever she comes from. I want their belly to be full. And while you're gathering and you're reaping the harvest, I want you to make sure that when you're reaping it, that when you're bundling that up, that you take a portion of that bundle and you drop it on purpose. Not just the pieces. I want you to drop the whole thing. And I want you to leave it there and make sure she knows that it's there. I want her to be able to see where you leave it. And then you bring that to me. Don't say anything to her. And then Ruth walks through the fields and she sees these and she begins to gather them and she takes them home to Naomi. 
And they're eating, and Naomi says, what is going on? And she inquires, and she said, they, I found favor. Boaz comes, and he meets Ruth, asks where she's come from, gets the full story from her. And he said, I don't want you going into another land. You'll never go to another land. I want you to stay here. Long story short, the father sets up a moment where she can come and she can minister to that man to take care of him, whatever's required. Not to, she didn't go to him in that moment to be his wife. She went to him as a sign of peace and thankfulness. I want to uncover your feet and I want to uncover your feet only to say I'm willing to sit at literally under the table and eat whatever crumbs you will allow. And she honored him. In his heart, the father put it in him to receive her as his wife. But he couldn't do that because he was not next in line to receive her. There was one between him and Elimelech. So he went to the gate and he sits at the gate. Again, I'm paraphrasing. He sits at the gate and he waits for this one to come. And this one comes and he says, will you come and sit with me for a second? He invites the one who has a right to Ruth to come and sit with him as was the custom. And he says to him, now you know that Elimelech, our family, has land. And his widow is living on that land today. But she has to sell the land because she can't afford to keep the land. So it's up to you. I will buy it. But you're the next in line. Do you want to buy it? And he said, I do. And I will purchase that land. And then he said, but there's something you need to know. It's not just Naomi that's on that land. Elimelech's son had a widow. So if you buy that land, you're going to get her. She becomes your wife. And again, long story short, he said, now wait a minute. That's more than I'm willing to purchase. I don't want her too. So you can buy the land. And in turn, you can have her as wife. And this is where the story picks up. Verse 13, Ruth 4. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, even though Ruth might have seen it that way, Naomi did not, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. What a powerful statement. Let's read 15 again. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, and who is more to you than seven sons. You have favored me, Naomi. You have loved me more than you could have seven sons of your own. It's powerful what she had gleaned, the attitude, the habits, the character, the faith she had learned from her, in this case, mother-in-law. Then Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap, and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. And they named him Obed. And Obed was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, who is the father in the line of Jesus Christ. Ruth had the right attitude. Ruth had the right habits. And Ruth had faith in God. And Ruth acquired all of that because there was a woman, in this case, was not her mother by birth. Could have been. And might be for you. But the woman who means so much to you might not be the woman of your birth. But she's a woman who has become a mother to you. Ruth had the right attitude, right habits, and she had faith in God. And she was determined, no matter what, she was going to honor Naomi and she would not abandon her. She demonstrated her habits of hard work and selfless service to others. She went and she said, I'm going to take care of this lady. I'm a widow, but she is too. She has cared for me, and I'm going to care for her. Her faith in God began in Naomi, but was completed in redemption. She redeemed the family line. She redeemed 
Elimelech's bloodline. Ruth learned how to be a mother from one who loved her, taught her, and inspired her to believe for what she had not yet received. Her character became or was of the character of Naomi. I can tell you when I think about moms and the impact moms have, today I really wanted to focus on the types of moms that we all have. Some of your mothers, some mothers, some of your mothers, our mothers, are still living. Some of them are no longer with us. Some of those who have had the most impact on us, they might be our mom biologically. They might be our mom that is not biological. Point is, in this room and under the sound of my voice or watching online today, no matter who you are, there is a woman who in every sense of the word has mothered you, whoever that is. Naomi again knew how to be a mother, but in her knowing how, she taught Ruth how to become a mother. So I'm saying to all the moms today that are a mama, thank you for being a mama. Thank you for yourself learning how to be a mom. But I exhort you today, when you look down the road and you're seeing the next generation, rejoice in whatever motherhood you have been blessed with. But share the wheat in your field, what you have learned, with the one that is in front of you. You know how to be a mother. Help another know how to become a mother. Happy Mother's Day. Every mama. Every mama that is and every mama that will be. We are who we are today because you press on. I recognize that daddies, and this is so true of our kids, and and, um, as a father, it is my responsibility to show the way, to point the way, to design the path, to lay out the path for my children to walk on. It is my responsibility. That's my role as a father. This is the path. Let's walk in it. I need you to go in it. But man, what a dad can't do is when a child begins that path, fathers struggle sometimes to pad the path correctly. (laughs) Our walls are brash. It's not pretty. Our walls are blocked with some grout in there, some mud in there, whatever's in there. And it can be rough on the fingers if you drag them down. Mama's going to come in there and she's going to smooth those walls out. I said to the team this morning as I was reflecting, we were reflecting on this, something Tim Darnell had said. And and I was thinking, uh, in my notes actually, wrote it this morning too, that when I was, our children were young and they were little and... um, I wanted to be, I mean, I wanted to be the best dad on the planet. I mean, from the time we knew my wife was pregnant, I mean, she was pregnant five months after we married, we, there was no intention in our world to, to wait. I mean, we just, we just felt like, you know, hey, um, we're adults. I don't know what we're going to learn more later than we know now. And um, <laughs> so she was pregnant at five months and when she was pregnant the entire time, I just, in my world, I just wanted to be the best daddy. In her world, she's going to be the best mama. Now, I knew she would accomplish it. I was worried about my part. <laughs> and what she had seen and what I had seen was very different. And um, so when my kids were born, all of them, all three of them, I just know those times, again, I just wanted to be that dad. And I would take those babies and I'd say, babe, listen. You're with them all the time. Let me take care of these babies. And you go and you just have some fun. You go to the mall. Go get your nails done. Go get whatever it is you want to do. Go, you go be with your friends and just have a blast. Take your time. I'll, it's Saturday. I can, I'll be here all day. Just leave me what I need. Give me whatever brief instruction that I might need. You know, I'm, I've watched you do this thing. I've got it all day long. She'd be gone in two hours. Somebody, she said this morning, she said, I'm mm, not sure you made it that long. She'd be gone about two hours. And I'd be on the phone with her trying to find, back then there were no cell phones. So I'm calling everybody I knew. Is she at their house 
rotary dial, <laughs> calling everybody I knew. Babe, I know I told you to go have fun, and I hope you did. Can you come home, please? <laughs> I don't know what to do now. What do you mean? What is she doing? Well, she's crying. Well, just love her. Just hold her. Just comfort her. I've done that. I've comforted her. I've lo- and by the time I was done, I was mad. And it's like, I can get home. <laughs> and what it turned into was the moments when I would say, honey, go and just, just have fun because, you know, you just keep trying. There's no quit in me. Well, until hour two. And, <laughs> and then she would say, babe, are you sure? And then it was no time at all, and, and she began to realize, I'm just going to be gone for an hour. Just let me go for an hour. But my point being this, there's something special about a mama. There is nothing, no task too great for a mama to take care of and to handle. None. None. A mama will do absolutely anything. And dad will too. I would do anything. I would die for my kids. Most likely, I would die for your kids. Depends on you. No, I'm just kidding. But I can tell you I would die for my kids. And my wife would too. The difference between a father and a mother is the father would die more quickly. Because we would make the rash decision. When the mama's going to say, there's a path. There's a way. So to every mama, again, you're a mama right now. Thank you for bringing us into the world. Now I ask you once again. For those who are going to become a mama, share that wealth of wisdom and anointing, character, faith, attitude, fearlessness, selflessness with those who are coming. Amen. Amen.